Welcome everybody to the Harrison Gregory Club. It's uh, again, wow, what a great packed house. Uh, so great to see some Rotarians here we haven't seen for a while and some new faces and some guests. So we'll start out as we always do. Um, so please join me uh, in the four-way test of the things we think, say, A song is by Leslie. Let's turn to the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance. And today's invocation is by Eric Codger. Day and Rice, come up and introduce our many guests today. Hello, everybody. We have five guests today. We have April Helper here and Andrew Mails of the uh, Daggio House. Uh, Noah's guests, you want to introduce them, please, Noah? Yes, we were. We finished it up. Um, we also have Obi Hill here. He's uh, a member of the city school board. Um, welcome, Obi. Great to have you here. Um, we also have Keenan Moore. That's the blame. Yes. Also, I would echo what Noah said. Get to know Keenan, a great friend of mine. He's part of the Klein May Umbrella of Realtors. It's a great job. Um, has lots of good stories to tell. That's welcome to you. And we also have Dr. Michael Richards today. He is our speaker. He is the superintendent of the Harrisonburg City Public Schools. Welcome. Great to have you all here. Wow, so yeah, so great to have everybody here today. Um, in regards to family of Rotary, I do have one very sad announcement to make. You have seen probably through the Rotograph and others that Dick Johnson passed away last week. And Dick Johnson was part of this club for a very long time. And uh, interesting timing, I just handed wit. Uh, Dick was due to get another multiple Paul Harris fellow. And so I've given that to wit and hopefully wit will see to it that family gets that, but he was a, a great Rotarian, a great person, so uh, we'll miss him. Any other family of Rotary or comments to make? So we continue to encourage everybody to track their hours of service, and speaking of hours of service, again, despite short notice, thank you for those that helped Saturday at the Daggio House. Quentin, talk a little bit more about what else is going on, service.
Um, on Saturday, we were able to do a service with Kids Clock for having us. Um, next month, uh, in November, on November 6th, that's a Sunday afternoon, we're going to help with the Veterans Day Parade um, with HDR. It's just helping veterans get lined up for that parade. So it should be pretty light work. Uh, we'll have some information with the photograph going forward. In December, we're looking to uh, help out in the food pantry. So starting next week, we have a box at the entrance to bring in uh, non-perishable food uh, to donate. Uh, we'll collect that through October and November, and then we'll take it with us when we do our service project in December. Uh, and then in January, since we're for Martin Luther King Day, right now up in Oak Park for our Martin Luther King Day day of service, uh, which we've done for several years. That Monday, Martin Luther King Day, we're celebrating the book of the first Martin Luther King Day Park. Um, the goal behind this, I feel like when I was president and then Braden after me, uh, we weren't able to do a lot of services, right? And then we, we at least did service projects and we were able to get a lot of things done. The goal now is small. So I don't expect to see everybody out there when you serve the Martin Luther King. Just pick one that's in your calendar, uh, come out when you can. We're trying to even not necessarily have a whole sign up sheet. Want to have opportunities for service. So these are five to ten members who show up on Saturday morning, an hour or two. And how beneficial was it that you all had a good service? Yeah, and it was only four of us, and we were there for an hour and a half. So I guess that gave you know, the first year that we had roughly the same amount of people. So thanks, Dan. <laughs> but anyway, those are some service projects that are coming up. If you have any questions about service or if you have ideas of things that you can do next year, Talk to me or Noah. We're trying Speak to into the mic so we can hear. The second service Saturday is what we're looking to do. The second Saturday of every month in the morning, a couple hours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Quentin. Yes, it's it's exciting to get back to doing more normal rotary things. We're building that way all the time. So, and also speaking of doing things that we didn't do for years, we had a Rotary Social event Thursday. I just want to give a quick report. It was a wonderful event, beautiful weather. We had 64 sign up, lots of family members. I think we had somewhere in the 50s show up. And uh, it was just a lot of fun. And I don't have the prizes yet, but the low score was Les Helmuth on the putting course. I don't know if you saw that. Yeah, yeah. And he really wanted, I think he elbowed one of his grandkids. Um, and I think you kicked a golf ball, but yeah, but at least you got the W. So, okay. So, uh, no, we're excited about that. That was a great, um, great event. Thank you for those that came out. And so, um, with that said, I'm going to do the introduction for our speaker today because we want to give them plenty of, give him plenty of time to speak. And so, we have today Dr. Michael Richards, who began work as superintendent of Harrisburg Public Schools on May 1 of 2019. Prior to being named superintendent for Harrisonburg City, Dr. Richards served as chief of staff for the Loudoun County Public Schools, director of data and accountability for the Del Val Schools in Texas, and in various district and campus leadership roles and teaching positions in four divisions in Texas and Maryland. His experiences have included special education, gifted education, special campuses, traditional campuses, research and development, state assessment, community relations, and classroom teaching from second grade to graduate school in subjects ranging from English to statistics. So give uh, Dr. Richards a warm welcome to Rotary today. First thing I want to do is, is thank you for not drinking my cup while we were singing. So um, it's wonderful to be here with you. I've got my little timer here, so I'm going to turn it on so I don't talk too long. Um, I'd like to walk around. I'll try to stay still. Okay. Uh, and um, so I was a member of Rotary in Ashburn in Loudoun County. I see that little hesitation. I may, someone may try to recruit me. That was back when I had time on my hands. And um, so, but I'm very much a fan of the vision statement. Um, you have an amazing inclusivity statement here. Um, and so you have kindred spirit about speaking. 
today. So thanks for inviting me. And the last time I spoke here, um, it was three years ago, and I spoke on the topic of a new high school. Anybody here for that? Do I remember that? All right. And so I want to I want to continue that journey with you. I want to continue that story with you. Obviously, it's being built right now, and I have some pictures to show you. But I'll but I want to tell a little bit more of the story before I do that. Oh, and Obi, thanks for coming. I've got a school board member with me. I just don't want to forget to thank you for being here. Um, so I've got a little list of of kind of the chronology of things. And when I last left you, uh, we were in a conversation about funding and about the basic concept. What will this school be? Will it be an annex? You know, that's near the new high school. Will you build on to the new high school? Uh, what will this be? Now, I came in after those conversations. I came in after about seven or eight years of conversations related to that. Um, that. It was about 13 or 14 years ago, and I'm relying on local historians for this. If I'm wrong, please tell me later. Um, don't tell me now, tell me later. Uh, but I, <clears throat> when I came in, I think there had been about 13 or 14, no, about 10 years when I came in of conversation um, when we noticed that the UVA data, they do our demographic data at the Weldon Cooper Center, um, was indicating that we we're going to outgrow the high school, or we'd already started to outgrow the high school. And so there was a conversation, what will the concept be, and then what about the funding? And so I was talking to you all about that back then, and I was kind of giving you a history of, you know, where does this idea come from that localities are responsible for building schools? Why isn't it the state? Why isn't it someone else? Why is it local tax money? So I kind of gave a little bit of a history on that. And um, so we went through that process. We contracted with a local builder at a good price per square foot, but it's a lot of money. It's $74 million to build the school. And then with all the additions, the road um, changes, the traffic lights and so forth, it's over $100 million, $105 million as the total price. That's a lot of money. And so when some people say that conversation took too long, it's, well, I'm not sure it did. I think it's important for the community to have a prolonged conversation about that and get to a conclusion that most people can agree with. Hopefully, more people will agree with it once it's up and running and they see what we're able to do with it. So I left you there. And then soon after that, the pandemic came and still sort of with us. And so we put a pandemic pause on it. I don't know if you're aware of that, but the city manager and I got together and said, with the projections the economists are coming up with, we need to pause this because it looks like we're gonna have such a severe reduction in revenue um, that especially from restaurants and so forth that we should not continue uh, right now. And so the builder kind of closed it up, took care of the property for this time period. So you know things wouldn't deteriorate. And we took that pause. The projections were dire, like 70% reduction in, in revenues, things like that. And so it was very questionable at that point whether we'd be able to start this back up. Well, what happened then was we were in a very, very difficult situation where we have a contract with a builder, and that contract is limited in, in the sense of time. They can go elsewhere. They can go build something else if we don't keep going. And at the same time, we're dealing with statistical analysis to figure out, you know, when will the revenues come back? Well, we've never been in a pandemic like that before. So how do we know when the revenues are going to come back? So it's very delicate. So we had to work through that and figure out, you know, what data will we use in order as markers to say it's safe to come back and build again? Or do we set some kind of an arbitrary date on that? How do we do that? So we worked with city council, school board worked with city council, and we decided that some of the federal money that was coming in from the pandemic, which is allowable uh, for construction, we could use some of that coming in to restart. And it would also reduce the taxpayer burden of like this, but that was coming in from the federal government. And so it would reduce the tax burden a little bit. It would bridge that gap so that we were able to start the building again keep our contractor. And I'll tell you, we have a local contractor. We did that on purpose. We didn't expect a pandemic, but it really came in handy to have a local contractor who really cares about this community. And so Nielsen was willing to wait with us uh, for a pretty significant amount of time. So we got back on track. 
And uh, we are on track now to open in August of 24. Uh, that is a year later than we had hoped, but it, it, we are on track to open um, in August of 24. And a lot of the work that needs to be done now in terms of opening a high school, which is very complicated, much easier. If you ever open a school, open an elementary school, much easier. High schools are complicated. And so we have had a lot of processes in place. So we had a naming committee. Anybody here of the naming committee? Anybody on the naming committee? I honestly don't know who was on the committee, but they came up with um, suggestions for a name. And then we got a lot of student input on the name and the colors. And the name was Rocktown High School and the colors are black and red. My colors up there. And so, um, and then we also were trying to find a mascot for this school. So if you have any ideas, I'm open to them. Actually, the students are going to choose the mascot, but it was amazing how many adults in the community wanted to kind of send their mascot in, you know? Like there's this particular black bird that lives in the valley and nowhere else. That should be the mascot. I got a lot of that stuff. It's really cool. What's the idea, John? What is it? A pet rock. I'll float that with the kids. We'll see what they say. I told the kids, you know, how about thunder? You've got lightning and thunder. It'd be great. The perfect storm when they play on the football field, right? The kids are like, that's stupid. <laughs> No, they really did. They really did say that. <laughs> they go, how do you, how do you, how does thunder walk around on the field? I'm like, how does lightning walk around on the field? I mean, you've got that solved, so come on. Anyway, we'll see what they come up with. Um, and so lots of student input, very important. Students need to own this school. And so we're now in that part of the process where we're doing the programming. <clears throat> and so what the community said before my time, uh, in the space study meetings, the concept meetings, they said they want two comprehensive high schools. They don't want it to be like one comprehensive high school and then an annex that kind of just gives some of the students during the day. They want two comprehensive high schools, which means, of course, they want two sets of athletic teams, bands, and this kind of thing. No, everybody knows our band does what all the time. It wins. It wins all over the country in competition. So nobody's going to want to split up that band. So that's going to be a tough one, okay? I don't know if we're going to. Maybe for competitions, we can keep them together. We're thinking outside the box here. And so the programming, comprehensive, so any student in Harrisonburg can say, I'm going to go to whichever school, and I'll tell you what the boundary decision was in a minute, but whichever school I go to, there's a comprehensive program. So I don't have to worry that, oh, well, because I live in this part of town, I don't get what's over there. At the same time, the planning committee said, when we heard about the $30 million auditorium that was in the plan from the architect, we said, wait a minute, we've got an auditorium, a beautiful one. I mean, our fine arts program, again, talk about winning awards. <clears throat> and so we said, well, let's, instead of doing that, <clears throat> let's build some more modern labs for CPE, that's career and tech education, and for STEM education, while we have the opportunity over at the new school, because you can't really retrofit a school for those kinds of labs. And so for the health sciences and so forth. So we'll build those and then we'll share the facilities. And so when, when students are older, junior, senior year, and they're in advanced courses that require a lab that's at one school, not the other, or an auditorium that's at one school, not the other, we're gonna share those. So that's part of the programming. And I kind of see that as sort of the Harrisonburg way. You know, it's not haves and have not. Everybody gets to, to share those facilities. Um, so now we're looking at staff distribution as well. So what will be our staff distribution? We have, we have preloaded, thanks to city council and the school board for helping us preload some positions, right? So the high school now is very overcrowded, 650 kids more than should be in there, not by fire marshal standards. I need to clarify that. So people leave when they hear me say that and go, oh no, the kids are all, no, but by programming standards. So the school was made to house 1350. And when we opened the school in August of this year, we had 2012 kids in the school. And so we're six, about 650 kids over for programming purposes. Fire marshal's still okay. 
but we're not okay in terms of how we try to educate students within that space. Um, we have four lunch shifts. I think you all heard all this. So I won't go too far into it, but it's it's le way less than ideal for our, our students, our teachers. And so we want to, we front loaded a lot of positions. So there are two athletic directors. One will go to the other school. There are enough counselors for the students who are in the school. But when we open the new one, of course, many of those students go over to the other school and we move counselors as well. Um, if you know teachers at the high school, don't make them nervous, please. Don't tell them I'm just going to move them. So I always ask people, I always get feedback before I do things like that. So the first step would be, <clears throat> who wants to move to the new school? A lot of teachers would say, no way. I've been in this classroom for 30 years and I'm staying right here. Some teachers who may be newer will say, I'd love to go over there and try that out. That sounds great. So we'll ask them, we'll get input from them, not just move them around. But then we will have to make some hires as well. So we'll hire a principal, a bookkeeper, and we'll hire a counseling director pretty soon. So in the early spring semester, we'll hire those folks so that they can start all of the, the rest of the hiring, ordering, and, and um, working on what's called the master schedule. And that's where, um, you know, like in a college course catalog, you know when courses are and what you need to take and what the sequence is. We'll work on all that stuff early because we're gonna share the facilities uh, with the older students. So we front loaded positions, which is very good. Um, and then we have to work on the athletics and the band questions and that kind of thing. And of course, transportation, gotta work on that. Have you heard we have a transportation problem? Yeah. So one solution I have is I'm trained to be a bus driver. I'm going to get my CDL and I'm going to drive afternoon activity buses because I've been trying to get to know kids better, especially seniors. I want to shake hands with people I know on the stage. So I'm getting my CDL and I encourage anyone in this room who wants to drive a bus to get your CDL with me. I'm, I'm getting it at the city. We don't the school system doesn't control the bus, it's the city does. Um, I want to drive for On the Road. Has anybody heard of On the Road Collaborative? Yeah, I want to drive for them mainly. So um, we're going to work that out as well. And, and we have to rearrange a few things and, and work with the city on that and we can get that done. Now I said I'd talk about the boundary before I get into the um, pictures I have to share. Um, the school board decided on a boundary that runs right down between the two middle schools. And that's, so in other words, Thomas Harrison students would be assigned to HHS and then Skyline students would be assigned to Rocktown. And it does divide the city evenly in terms of numbers. Also, it's demographically even, which is very convenient. We don't have to do any gerrymandering and so forth to do that work. So that's the decision that has been made for the boundary. So I, I want to share with you what this looks like. Um, this is a picture that does not include the whole property. I'll walk away from the camera just for a minute. Um, the, the north side of the property comes down pretty far here. And it's a big oval shape. And down here, you've got the athletic. Well, here's the track. And you can see where the stadium will be. The field house is here. Um, and then you've got two wings that can be built onto. So when the space study, again, before my time said, we can't build on to the, it, one option should be building onto the current high school. The engineer said, you can't do it. And here's why. The core facilities are not adequate in order to do that. So the school can't sustain continued growth because of the, the sewage facilities, the size of bathrooms, the size of the cafeteria. Those are the core facilities. And so that's why you couldn't do it. So we have planned for the future by being able to build on both of those wings. And so these are the academic wings. Well, they're all academic wings, but these are the core subjects. Then you've got your fine arts back in here, your gymnasium and um, a cool uh, media studio over here and so forth. So softball and baseball fields are on the far north side of the property. Um, if you keep going a little ways on the right, you see a structure being built. It's not ours. Everyone keeps saying, why are you building that other structure? That's U-Haul. Okay. So, and a lot of people said when we started on this, and again, I think it's a great site for a school. I know there are people who disagree with that. 
when you go into this school and you look out the windows, you'll see why I like it. Because the way the, inch, the architects designed it, every window you look out of sees the beautiful blue, the, um, Shenandoah Valley. You don't see, no offense to Stephen Toyota, but you don't see Stephen Toyota. Okay, you see the valley. And, you know, um, Stephen Toyota can see us, but we can't see them. And so we're building an infrastructure of roads. Um, you can see here that it was JMU purple, and people kept saying, are you really making it JMU purple? And I said, if they're undefeated this year, I will. But it's, um, but that, that's actually, so I may have to make it purple, right? Um, but that's actually just some weather um, resistant material that's been on there. It used to be all purple, but you can see they're, they're putting that, and you can tell I'm an expert in construction, right? <laughs> now they're putting the green stuff on. <laughs> large bay doors that we have for some of the labs um, these days um, with some of the work that students are doing for career in tech there's some big equipment involved and the older schools you know hhs isn't really that old but they weren't thinking about that back then when they were building schools the road uh, one of the major road projects you can see the curb going in and that'll be paved very soon this is in the parking lot we did geothermal so Underneath the parking lot are geothermal wells, and those are all in, obviously, they have to go in first. And these are just little islands that are being planted now with sod. I didn't think you could plant sod this time of year, and they told me it's the perfect time to do it. So trees too, for some reason. Are they, are they lying to me? Is that true? Okay, good, good. I've always got to check these things. Um, the gymnasium, um, this is a kind of a, a cool little angle from a big common space into a courtyard where students, like, has anybody been in the courtyard at HHS? The students love it out there. It's in the middle of the school. This one has a courtyard that's on the outside of the school. Um, again, this is that big common space, which will actually be where they eat. So it's the cafeteria, I like to call it common space. They're also learning <clears throat> spaces within this um, large cafeteria area where you can learn. So every part of the school is made for learning. Even one of the staircases is made to hold a class on. You can see them putting in <clears throat> some insulation and drywall. You can see the sheetrock, the purple back there. Those are counseling offices. You can see some colors coming on board. You got some yellow and some blue. That's the fine arts. That goes down into the fine arts wing. Again, the big common space, but we learn every time we build a school. And so what happens when kids go to the cafeteria and they finish their lunch early? No, they don't wanna go play a video game on their phone. They wanna to go to their counselor. And so we put the counseling offices right next to the cafeteria. Now they don't have to go trotting down the hall for you know five minutes. Um, Cause they get lost sometimes when they do that. So um, another, just an inside view. Um, and then you're on the second floor and you remember what I said about the views from the windows, you can see one of them there. And just some more of the insulation going in, the duct work is almost complete. Um, they've got the floors all covered up because we're doing uh, polished concrete, right? You have to protect that while you're building. And that, those are my pictures. Whoops, and uh, that's your slide. So I think that I have, oh, look at that. I've talk for 20 minutes exactly what I was supposed to do. So I'll take some any questions that you have. Oh yeah. Um, so the school is located um, so I always say it's near Stephen Toyota and um, the old what's that restaurant called? Pan something? Panos, thank you. Um, do you know where those are? A bunch of car dealerships. And the city bought the land from JMU. JMU was going to build something there, but sold it um, to the city for the school. And so it's a long piece of land. It has several features where you can have outdoor learning, which you know I'm big into, right? I like outdoor learning. Our kids like outdoor learning. And so you have those sorts of things as well. It is um, along 81. But what they're doing is they're building up a buffer of land there. And so it's not as, as audible as you might think it would be. 
tough question, I think. Uh, how much federal funding came back that you're using for this school? Three million a year for three years. Wow, that's not much. It's not much to bridge the gap. <laughs> and that, that makes sense now because my real yeah. estate taxes for the last two years have gone up yeah. more than double digits mm -hmm. in the last two years, percentage-wise. Yeah. And you're talking about we're getting the revenue back. So how much revenue, are we getting that revenue back? It, to help? It's, it's probably only a penny. For, um, yeah, it's only about a penny of the anticipated 14% increase. But it's something. Thanks for coming out and speaking. Yeah. Uh, how are you combating the school, the the uh, teacher uh, challenges yeah. in the school system? Yeah, great question. Teachers have have faced a lot more stress, a lot more pressure on them um, since the pandemic and during the pandemic. Um, last year, we were one of the only school divisions in the Commonwealth when faced with that challenge. When teachers were telling us what they need, we were the only one that I know of that took decisive action and actually shortened the day. That took a lot more work than you would think. You don't just shorten the day. You have to compress some of the instructional time and make sure kids aren't learning, learning, uh, losing, sorry, learning opportunities. Um, so it took a lot of work with master schedules, but we did allow teachers to have more time um, in order to plan and communicate with families, which is part of the, the stress they're facing. They know how important it is to plan and work with their colleagues and to communicate with families. And so they had that extra time. Now the state has, has laws in place um, that have to do with how long you have to have schools open and so forth. And so it's what's called the 180, 180 day, 990 hour rule. And so you can't just shorten the day um, without certain waivers in place. <coughs> and you can't do it for a full year because of those rules. Uh, but that's one thing we did. Right now we're, we're getting, we're working with a company called EAB, which is a think tank um, that works with school divisions. And we're working with them on surveying teachers and then responding to those surveys, taking action based on those surveys. And so what do they need? We're, we're talking to them and asking them what they think the best solutions are and then working on that with them. So that's what we're doing now. Um, how much is the total cost of the school? Expected. It's about 105 million with all the projects that need to be done in addition to the building of the school itself. So, and and how, much is that, how much is the increase because of the pandemic? Well, that's a great question. Nielsen, um, you talk about front loading, we front loaded positions, they front loaded materials. And so if you went out there, you would see a lot of concrete pipes and things in the field. And so they, they, they stockpiled that material, steel as well. They had a lot of steel before they, they they really got going. And so they anticipated those challenges and they brought that stuff to the site. And so it hasn't increased. Um, Halifax is building a new high school that's very similar if you look at the floor plan. Um, and they're, they their architects estimated it would be 109 uh, right now. And then it came out at 100 and 26.5. And so one of the big questions we had, um, the city manager and I, was what would it cost if we waited? You know. And so again, I talked about that really challenging period where we were saying, well, we're gonna lose our contractor if we don't move on this. You know, We've gotta keep the contractor. We do have a good price per square foot. If you look at schools built in Virginia, high schools, high schools are very expensive. We have a good price. So we need to keep that. But the other question had to do with materials and, and delay. What will happen if we delay? It'll be 10 million more, it'll be 15 million more and that kind of thing. Well, Halifax is facing this. Their board of supervisors just denied them the additional, I don't, I, I may be off on my math here, but I think it was, was 16.5 million additional that they needed once the full price came back. And they said no. And the reason they said no is interesting reason they gave is that the General Assembly recently has put money toward capital projects, which is a wonderful thing. And we actually push for that. It's in our, our legislative program because the Virginia Constitution says that each child in Virginia is entitled to a high quality education. 
Well, that's always been on the operation side. The standards of quality that we use to, to uh, put teachers in place and counselors in place and so forth is only on the operational side of the budget. But we said, and we and a lot of people agreed with us, that we really need to put some effort into the other side of education, which is the capital improvement side. And so the General Assembly listened and they did that. And so um, I think Halifax, and I don't want to speak for them, but it was in the paper, they said something to the effect that we're hoping that once that money is released, we can use it for some of that. And then we don't need to give you an additional 16.5 million. Um, we are also hoping that since we'll still be in the project when that money becomes available, that we can apply uh, for a grant that would allow us to defray some of the costs. So we're looking at that too. Um, part of what the General Assembly has done already is releasing some money for capital improvements um, and school divisions have already received some of that. So, for example, we need a new chiller at an elementary school and a new chiller costs a lot more than your HVAC unit at home. It's a million dollars, $980,000. We're piggybacking on a contract JMU has that saves a little money, but it's a million dollars. And so we got 2.6 already from the General Assembly's recent actions. And so we're using a million of that to put the chiller in place, no addition to the taxpayer. Um, my, my question, um, I went to Harrisonburg High School from 94 to 98, and they had just finished remodeling Harrisonburg yeah. High School to the you know, students. Yeah. And then a couple of years later, the school board decided to sell Harrisonburg High School and build a new one. Yeah. Then they were going to use the old Harrisonburg High School to get the children out of the trailers at uh, Waterman Elementary School. That was oh. the whole reason they yeah. were council. And then within getting the money a week later, then they just decided to sell it to the new. With this new high school going in, are the children still going to be in the trailers at Waterman Elementary School? And also, I guess with the cost, right, increased interest rates, um, is that going to hit y'all too with, uh, with new monies? Um, so second question first, no, um, we're not going to have to. We're locked in. So that's another good thing with not delaying any further. Um, and, and that was a guessing game that could have gone down, right? Steel prices could have gone down, um, but no. And so the first question, will the Waterman trailers go away? We all want the Waterman trailers to go away, right? I mean, they don't look very nice. We've tried painting them and the paint peels off. Um, we Kids have, have ideas about what to do with them and I'm considering those. Um, but the trailers of the high school need to go away. That's that's what's going to happen. It's like a, it's it's a whole complex of fourteen trailers, including one I put in this year, that is gigantic. It's just larger than four of the smaller ones, and it's being used as an auxiliary cafeteria. It's ridiculous. It is, and so those need to go away, and they will with a considerable cost savings. But we do have to spend a lot of money up front to remove them, unfortunately. Uh, but there will be a cost savings over time. I don't know the answer to the Waterman trailers at this time. Um, in our CIP, we do have, uh, the CIP is the capital improvement plan. We work with the city on that. We do have a placeholder about five years out for purchasing land for another elementary school because some of our elementary schools are pushing at the boundaries, but we're making other adjustments so that we don't have to do that. So for example, we moved the family welcome center downtown rented out a space to move to downtown. So the Keister, which is the most crowded of them, could expand within its own wall. So we're looking at things to do so we don't have to uh, build. But it, I think Harrisonburg will probably continue to grow. Um, it's a wonderful place to live. I love raising my family here. And I think other people do as well. So I think we'll continue to grow. Thank you, Dr. Richards, sure. for a great presentation. Let's give him a round of applause. I am going to steal back two minutes that I didn't take before, if I could, to close out the meeting. So when I had um, mentioned about Witt delivering Dick's Paul Harris, I skipped over two important presentations. One of the most important things we do at Rotary, I think, and I would like to call Matt Sunderland and Dave Larson up real quickly. I want to acknowledge Paul Harris fellow multiples. 
And for those of you that are visitors that don't understand what this is, um, we have giving to the Paul Harris Foundation, um, the gift that, become, that makes you a Paul Harris Sustainer Fellow. And now we have the privilege of recognizing two members who have given multiple uh, gifts to become multiple Paul Harris Fellows. So your contribution, Matt and Dave, to the Rotary Foundation of Rotary International are laying suffering, improving life, living conditions, and providing educational opportunities for young people somewhere in the world. Your gifts are a selfless action and demonstrate your commitment to our common goals of world understanding and peace. So therefore, on behalf of the president of Rotary International and the chairman of the trustees of the Rotary Foundation, it gives me pleasure to present you with your multiple Paul Harris fellow pins, which I'll give you in this box. So let's please give a round of applause to Matt and Dave for being very generous. So thank you, thank you all for uh, attending today. Thank you for all of our visitors. And uh, again, it's great to see a full house in a full room and we are adjourned.